Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman and I work with the Skate Right Ministry and host the 1015 service online. These are the announcements for July 23rd, 2023. Join us for a Koinonia summer picnic on Saturday, July 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. There will be lots of outdoor activities for the whole family and the lunch main dish is provided. We ask that you bring a side or a dessert to share. After that, we will have a time of worship where the youth and the children will be sharing about all the exciting things God has been doing this summer. Please be here for this fun time together. The next real meeting is Saturday, August 5th at 10 a.m. This meeting is for ministry leaders, workers, or anyone interested in getting more involved with Living Hope. Don't miss it. The next men's breakfast is Saturday, August 12th at 8.30 a.m. This breakfast is a time for the guys to get together and hang out while they're eating good food. The suggested donation is $3. Invite a friend and come on out. Does the tech and media team interest you? We invite you to attend a one-day workshop on Saturday, August 12th from 2 to 4.30 p.m. This workshop is available in both English and Spanish, so we hope to see you there. Here at Living Hope, we encourage people to take the next steps in their spiritual walk. On the seat back in front of you, there are three QR codes that can help you do just that. The first one is the welcome code. If you are new with us or you just haven't let us know who you are, we would love to have you scan that code or visit the Welcome Center after the service. If you've been coming for a while and it's time to get involved, we could use all the help we can get. So scan that serve code and get involved. To financially support Living Hope, you can scan the give code or you can drop your tithes and offerings in the black boxes at the back of the sanctuary on your way out or you could visit our new church website. We're glad that you've been here today and we hope that you enjoy our service. Have a great week. Hello everyone, this is Pastor Carlos. I'm here in uh, Magdalena in Lima, Peru. I'm preaching here today. And uh, this is a, a work that we started last year. We came here and did some missionary work. We did some, uh, went around and invited people and now they already have a place that they're meeting. If you can see around here, they're about to start their Sunday school. And uh, across the street is a park, and that's where they do their preaching. It's a great place to come if you want to be part of a mission. Uh, thank you, and uh, I hope to see you next week. Pastor Carlos got to, uh, in his, for his job, he had to go down to Brazil, and then he had to go to Peru. And so we touched base with our partner there at Morada, and Pastor Pepe and Oriste, and they had him preach over Magdalena. was the, like you said, the one we started last June where we went down there. They have a church now that meets. They just got the building here within the last year, which is great, because uh, there's a market square in Magdalena, which is where we did most of our work and, uh, for, for them. And so we did that, and so they still meet in the outdoor amphitheater that's part of the park uh, for the service. And so that's kind of cool uh, to do that. And, and then they have the building they can meet in for the rest of the things that they do. So God's doing a good stuff there. They run about 40 in their worship service on Sunday morning. And so that's a praise God kind of thing. Magdalena's on the left, uh, the coast side of uh, Lima, right up against the water. You, go, you can literally go to the edge of the cliff and look out at the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's a walkway to go down to the ocean if you want to. But uh, yeah, so that's a great thing. That's the Catholic Center. That's where the Diocese of Lima is there. The largest Catholic university in Peru is there. And that's where we did a lot of work there uh, when we went down there last June. And so pray for he's well he's already done he's he's already done for the day I mean come on so and so uh, so that it's, it's cool that we have partnerships so we can do that Amen. and that's the value of working together to accomplish the great commission and to do the things that God has called us to do and uh, I he texted me Elizabeth he texted me from La Lucha La Lucha is my one of my favorite Ross restaurants on the planet and so he Pastor Carlos to to rub it in just took a picture of the sandwich he was eating, the chicken the chicharron he was having in, and, and boom. They have the best hamburger ever. You want to ask me my best hamburger I ever had, it was actually at La Lucha in Lima, Peru. It is fantastic. Anyway, I digress. I'll remind you about the picnic next week, the Koinonia picnic. I encourage you to come be a part of that and uh, enjoy that. We're going to do it during the day. I uh, want to encourage you to come be a part of that. If you're a guest, you're more than welcome to come at that as well. Uh, Koinonia is our way to get all of our three of our services together in, at one time. 
because of the way we do church around here, it's hard for uh, the 8.30 crowd to see the noon crowd and vice versa. So it's our way of occasionally getting together as one church family, and we're going to do that next, next Saturday. Uh, Keith and I will take care of the meat part, the church take care of the, the drinks and the paper and all that stuff. You guys bring stuff for a picnic. Amen. Um, it will be from 10 to 2. Uh, we'll be out, so we'll eat probably around 11.30, noon. Uh, we'll come back in here around 1, 1.15. We're going to have the students share from their trip to camp. That will be our time together in here. Uh, like, let you guys, especially for like the 8.30 service, for those guys to hear what God did through you guys when you were up there as well. So I encourage you to come back next Saturday. Uh, the Ignite crew put me out there Friday night. We played soccer and volleyball, and Saturday was a rough day for me. i got to be really honest with you on that one. I was a little stiff. I'm not 25 anymore, Jeannie. And so... Amen. That's it for that. And also, just pay attention with what's going on in the bulletin. There's a lot of stuff as we get to the winding down of summer as it is. Believe it or not, school starts for some people here in a couple weeks. Some parents are saying, praise God. Some parents or uh, kids are saying, I don't think so. And so, uh, and so we want to be prepared for that and to be part of that. All right, I got a lot of things to cover, so you have to listen really fast. And the heat is on because I'm preaching the next service as well. So I got my own little thing to worry about that. Matthew chapter 5, if you would turn there, please. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount verse by verse. We are going to finish the introduction, the Beatitudes today. And as I've been doing as we've walked through this, through this together, I'm going to read starting in verse 1. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Lord, what a great time of worship this morning. Lord, I thank you for all the praise team did to lead us into your presence. And Lord, as we open your word, I pray I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank the praise team this morning, guys. They, like... Did a great job while well, Tim's taking some time off. And so let's get started. Amen? Amen? I want to show you a picture. This is Miriam. Miriam's in an African country. She's got a great smile on her face and her Bible in her hand. She was, earlier this year, she was closing her prayers with her husband and her daughter in their home when it was invaded by some terrorists. The terrorist proceeded to grab them. They took the daughter and her and put her aside and you know, held them. And then they proceeded to decapitate her husband in front of her. And then they, had, they, were trying, they tried to get the daughter to, and the wife to, or Miriam to pronounce their faith their faith in Jesus. Her husband was decapitated for being a follower of Jesus. Earlier this year, there was a Christian school in another African country. Terrorists went to the school. The boys' dorm locked their door to protect themselves. The girls didn't do that. They, just, they decided to flee and run as fast as they could. Some of them were killed. Some of them were other things that 
we need not discuss. The boys, since they locked the doors, the terrorists said, okay, we'll just take Molotov cocktails and we'll just throw them in through the windows. And 46 young men who were followers of Jesus were incinerated because they were followers of Jesus. Who's excited for persecution? Can we say nobody? Yet when you read stories of people who experience persecution, they seem to not be as bothered by it as we are here in America. There are over 3,000 church buildings burnt in China, according to Open Door, in 2021. I just read of another incident in India where Hindus seeking power in the region of India they are are seeking to eradicate anybody who is a follower of Jesus in that region. I'm not excited for persecution. I don't think anybody is. We in America have a hard time relating to this topic of discussion because we just don't experience it. We should be grateful. We should say amen because we live in the United States of America. And with all of our faults, you and I are still here, and I don't think I have to worry about quite yet somebody throwing a Molotov cocktail in here and locking the door. Jesus wraps up his discussion of the Sermon on the Mount by teaching the disciples that if they're going to live out the Beatitudes, this is the ending point of this. This is, if you're going to live this way, if you're going to live everything I just described to you in the first nine verses, this is what's going to happen. You will be persecuted. Will be. No doubt. It's the only beatitude that he gives commentary for. Did you notice that? You have to notice this. In verse 10, it says, Blessed are the persecuted because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Then he goes into verse 9 and he changes. It goes from third person to second. And he says to the disciples, You are blessed when they insult and persecute you falsely, saying every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice. That's very important. He's telling Peter, he's basically telling Peter, guess what's going to happen to you? Andrew, guess what's going to happen to you? Matthew, guess what's going to happen to you? Stephen, Luke, John, Richard Spring, you are going to be persecuted. And when we're done with this morning, I hope to help you to realize that if you are truly living out the Beatitudes, you are being persecuted. Jesus is very nuanced here. And if you're not being persecuted because you are a follower of Christ, and we'll close out with that later in a few moments, you need to ask yourself why. Amen? Yeah, you guys are just as quiet as the first service. Nobody likes this subject. If you're a guest here, folks, we're preaching through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going verse by verse. What we kind of do here is that we read the Bible. We go verse by verse. If the verse comes to it, we preach on it. That's what we do. I could have skipped over this. You won't find this message on TBN. And some of you may tune it out already because you think it's just not going to apply to me. And that is a conviction in and of itself. In the kingdom culture, followers of Jesus are happy 
They're happy because they're blessed, and they're blessed because God approves of and approves of them when they are persecuted because they follow Jesus and live the way of life he calls us to live. The reason for this is because it identifies us with Jesus, it reminds us of the reward to come, and it encourages us because it reminds us as well that we are not alone. So the obvious question we have to answer or ask for ourselves here in our context and in the context of what Jesus said in the time he said it, what does it mean to be persecuted? What does it mean? Well, it simply means inflict harm or suffering on people, whether mental, physical, social, emotional, or political who hold beliefs or values that the establishment, whatever the establishment is, which in the spiritual context, that's Satan and the world, considers wrong, inappropriate, or contrary to its beliefs. And the ironic thing of that definition is that there's not a whole lot of people who uh, who would argue with these are the kind of things that we should, as humans, be. Blessed are the poor, and they don't understand what they mean, but they say, well, blessed are the poor and the church. Humble, merciful, all those things. Those are good. What they don't want is Jesus in the picture. And when you say you're a follower of Jesus, you are saying you are following Jesus and the way he's called us to live and empowers us by his Holy Spirit to live. Now, we all say we like people who are humble, but then the world doesn't seem to reward humility at all, right? We all say we don't like prideful people, but yet prideful people seem to rule the day. But that's what it means. So with that broader definition, we need to really think about what it means to be persecuted beyond the extreme cases that I've given here just to make a point that there is persecution in this world for followers of Jesus. And there's a lot of it. I think the number I saw was something like one billion Christians live in places subject to persecution of the variety that I just described to you. Makes you humble. I encourage you, go to the Voice of the Martyrs website. Go to Open Door. Two good organizations that kind of track these things. See what people, the testimony, the story of people who live out their faith in this way. Because they don't know anything else. That's what they know. Followers of Jesus are persecuted because of righteousness. What does righteousness mean? That's simple. God's plan and purpose for your life lived out God's way as it's been taught in the Bible. So, you're a follower of Jesus, you're following God's plan for your life, you're following God's purpose for your life, and you're living out this plan and purpose the way God says to live it out in the Bible. That's what righteousness means here. It's actually a pretty good definition for righteousness in general beyond the being right before God. And that, that those conditions are important when it comes to talking about persecution. And we'll get to that here in a moment. Romans 12, too, because I get this a lot. It's like, how do I do this? Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, and you guys know this, many of you do, all Scripture is inspired by God, literally God-breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. If you want to understand God's plan and God's purpose and the way God wants you to live it out, two things you got to do very simply. Get on your knees and open the book. Well, I'll get on my knees, but I don't hear nothing from God. Stay there till you hear something. Well, then I hear something. How do I know it's God saying it to me? Open the book. God does not contradict himself. 
God is not going to ask you to do something that he says is not right in his word. God's not going to ask you to steal a car if you need a car. Why? Because God's pretty clear we're not supposed to steal. He is going to say, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. He's going to say, trust in me and I will provide for you. Well, I like the other one better. Let me introduce you to Jesus. How about that? Amen? Amen. If you want to know God's purpose, God's plan, and God's way to how to do these things, you got to get on your knees and you got to open the book. Amen. Persecution is a reality for genuine followers of Jesus. Jesus does not run from this topic. In fact, he, he mentions it several times throughout the Gospels, and there's a reason for it because it's going to happen. He wants the disciples to be prepared. We as the American church, we need to start getting prepared for this stuff. Amen. If you don't already understand it already. John 16, 33, Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. I just picked these two. I could have picked several that he talks about this in the context of, of, of persecution in the life. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, all who want to live a godly life, a righteous life, living God's plan, God's purpose, God's way, will be persecuted. No doubt. No doubt. If you're a follower of Jesus, you will be persecuted. So what does that look like? Well, let's get down to this. The nature of this persecution is very simple. It's, Jesus says that they insult. Insult is to speak harshly or negatively about a person when it is unjustified. Have you ever been insulted because of your faith? Now, let me just preface this just by being rich. Y'all know I can be rich sometimes, amen? Amen. You're insulted because of your faith in Jesus, not because you're a jerk. Amen? Amen. I know a lot of Christians, followers of Jesus, who say, who wears a badge of honor being a jerk. I don't find that anywhere in the New Testament. Amen. We're not supposed to be jerks. We are to have convictions and stand for our faith. But speak the truth in love and compassion, with humility, understanding what God has done for us, what the Holy Spirit is doing through us, doing it God's way, God's plan, God's purpose. If you're living that out, people are going to insult you. What do you what, what, give me an insult. Um, I don't know, which one do you want? Oh, there, there, there's, there's Rich. He's a pastor. Get that guy out of here. Oh, there's you. You, 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 know, you. Don't invite them. Oh, they say they follow Jesus, but they really don't. You're the most conceited person I know, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus. Falsely ties right into that. To communicate what is false with the evident purpose of misleading. There are people, if you're a follower of Jesus and genuinely living out your faith, they're going to try and undermine your success. Amen. We see this happening now. We see this happening in, you know, in, the, in the court system. Where Christians have to go to court to defend being able to live out their Christian beliefs as they run their own businesses. Now, there's a, two sides of that coin, guys. You've got to understand. If you're going to sit there and say, I'm a follower of Jesus and I don't want to serve a group of people, 
then if you go to a business and they don't want to serve you as a Christian, which is persecution, they have every right to do the same thing to you. But that's religious liberty, right? And freedom of speech. Don't sit there and say, I don't want to do this, and then say, when they come back and say, I don't want to do you either. Well, people have false agendas. We got to get rich off that school board. He's a preacher. We can't be having preachers on here. He, he actually believes parents have a right to be parents. Can't have him on those school boards, so don't ask me to run, guys. I'm not doing it. Amen. Amen. He's got beliefs that are contrary to the establishment, and he actually preaches on them. You can go watch him on YouTube. He's a hater, which is false. Amen? Amen? Are you tracking? Yes. Yeah. I love what those parents did in Chino Hills. I love what those parents did down in Temecula. But they're going to get persecuted for it, I can tell you flat out. And they are. It's the world we live in. It's not just going to be us in front and with cameras in front of us and lights on us. It's going to be you as well. It's inevitable. Amen. Jesus is clear about this. If you are living out your faith with a genuineness and a realness, which isn't a good word, but we'll go with it, you will be falsely accused. People are going to lie about you. People are not going to want you around. Or they'll let you be around till they don't want you to be around. Yeah. And there's going to come to a point where you're going to be at a crucible of faith in some circles where you're going to say, you know what, maybe I don't want you to be around right now. Because as much as we don't like being persecuted, by the fact that you are in the room, you are persecuting others because they know what you believe if they know what you believe. That's why when I always went to these charter school conferences and the teachers, I would hang out for dinner, but then I always went to bed to my room early because happy hour followed. It wasn't happy hour at five, it was happy hour after dinner, folks. They didn't want me around there. I knew that. I didn't want to be around that point. The scope of persecution is for those who are living righteously. This isn't a blanket statement about persecution, by the way. This is a statement about persecution for those who are seeking to live righteously. Blessed are you when you are per persecuted for righteousness' sake, not for being stupid. We live in a world that is just hard and difficult and unfair. Commentator Stuart Weber says this, Kingdom honor is not granted as compensation for the unfairness of life, but as a blessing on those who have actively pursued true kingdom righteousness and have been persecuted for it. Life is unfair. We live in a sinful world dark world and we live in a world that we will be reminded of in the next couple of weeks that darkness prefers darkness over light and if you are living out God's plan God's purpose God's way then when we talk about in the next couple of weeks being salt and light is an inevitable consequence of that and you will be Persecuted. You will be insulted. You will be falsely accused. You will be undermined. People will seek to get an agenda that gets you out of the picture. Jesus is very clear about this. It's 
So how are followers of Jesus to respond to persecution? Jesus is so good. Look at what he says. He says, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice. Y'all ain't even being persecuted, and that's a tough command right now. (laughs) Be glad and rejoice. See, I, I just lost half of you already. What do you mean be glad and rejoice when people lie about me and insult me? I don't know. Ask Jesus. I didn't make it up. And in the Greek, be glad and rejoice is translated and means be glad and rejoice. We're to be glad and rejoice first and foremost because it is evidence that you are a genuine follower of Jesus and you're not fake and you're not masking and you're not a hypocrite in the opposite direction. Where you walk out of here and you say you're a follower of Jesus and you live like a follower, but you go out there and you're more like the world. See, we like to put hypocrisy our way. We come in here and we go out there, but then what if we, what, you know, back and forth, both ways. Hypocrisy is hypocrisy. I mean, there's a lot of people who come into church who act like they're followers of Jesus and they're really not. How do I know? I can see you out there. I can see what you post. I just got unfriended by 120 people right now. (laughs) Yeah, forget Pastor Rich on that old, that new thing, that threads thing. I'm not getting threads, by the way, guys. I'm trying to, but I'm not getting it. I mean, I like it. I like the tone of it, but I'm like, man, it's just something else. (laughs) It's just something else I got to keep track of. Anyway. But if you're being persecuted, it's because they know Jesus is in you. That ought to make you happy. That ought to make you rejoice. That ought to make you prideful. And when they see Jesus in you, they're seeing the love of Jesus. They're not seeing the Pharisee in you. They're not seeing the political advocate in you. They are seeing Jesus as Jesus wants to be seen out in the world as you allow the Holy Spirit to empower you to love others and love your neighbors and to love one another as he has loved us. That is genuine. That's real. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. Because of Jesus. See, no matter how we live our lives, we can live as moral, clean lives as all we want. There's a lot of people who do, but if they don't say they love Jesus, they're just moral people. That's not offensive to the world. It's not offensive to us. But when we sit there and we start saying, well, I live this way because Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead, and he is my Lord and Savior, and his Holy Spirit empowers me to live this way and to love you and to love everything about about all this stuff, and then people get really uncomfortable. Acts 9, 4 and 5. I found this interesting just to remind you of this. Acts 9, 4 and 5. This is Paul having a conversation with Jesus. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, this is Jesus talking, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, I have a question here. When did Paul ever personally persecute Jesus? He never did. He didn't. 
But Jesus says, because we know what Saul was doing, he was persecuting the early church. He was persecuting Christians. He was there when Stephen was stoned. He was the coat clerk. But yet Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting Stephen? He didn't say that. He says, no, no, why are you persecuting me? If people persecute you, lie and insult you and falsely accuse you because you are a follower of Jesus, it's because you're a follower of Jesus. And they're persecuting him. That's a very important concept to grasp for us as followers of Jesus. Because again, like I said before, we can be moral people and look like it, and people won't care. They're only going to start caring about it when you say Jesus. And that's why we don't say anything about knowing Jesus. We just like people saying, Jason's a really nice guy. Rich is a really nice guy. But then if I say I'm nice because of Jesus, people get uptight. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a meddler. Why do you say that? Because there's some people who think they're persecuted being Christians when they were just stupid. Murder is wrong. Stealing is wrong. Meddling is wrong. Gossip is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because the Bible says it's wrong. God's plan, God's purpose, God's ways, that's revealed in Scripture. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify in having that name. Now, you've got to remember when Peter wrote this. Nero is in getting close or is in power at this point. Nero didn't care for Christians all that much. In fact, he used Christians, I remind you, as tiki torches for his garden. And he blamed them for the burning of Rome. He burned it. And Peter says to these people, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. And folks, we see this all throughout the history. You see it all through the New Testament. Look at their tradition. We don't know for sure, but for some, I mean, for Peter, crucified upside down at his request. John, exiled to Patmos. Others boiled alive. Paul decapitated for what? Following Jesus. Go through the reformers. Just go through church history. If you, I encourage you. Fox's Book of the Martyrs. I think that might be even out on the, on the web now. People have been persecuted since Jesus ascended. And even before that. And they're going to keep being persecuted. The Bible's pretty clear about that until he comes back. And we're supposed to rejoice and be happy about it. Why? Because it says Jesus to the world. It reminds us of our reward to come. See, Jesus bookends the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And at the end of this, he says, Blessed are the persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This is an intentional bookend because it's true. You live this out, you live these things out, this is the kingdom of heaven. You're going to have heaven. You're going to be in heaven. Your reward is in heaven. 
if you are poor in spirit, if you understand the depravity of your soul before God, the kingdom of heaven is yours because you need to know Jesus and you recognize that. If you are one who mourns your sin, you will be comforted because Jesus comforts us when we sin. When you are humble because you are humble before God because you recognize who you are before God, you are humble, you will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, hunger and crave and starve to live the way God wants us to live, God's purpose, God's plan, God's way. You will be filled because the Holy Spirit fills you. When you are merciful because you've been shown the mercy of God by your faith in Jesus and what Jesus has done for us on the cross, you will be shown mercy, so you should be merciful too. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. You needed a new heart. God gave you a new heart. Jesus gives you a new heart. That heart is pure and righteous and clean and white as snow. And you will see God when the time comes. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who strive for peace with God, strive for peace with others, strive to bring peace of God to others. When you do that, when that is your will and call, you are a son or daughter of God. And if you do all of those things, you are going to be persecuted because you're living the way God wants you to live and you will have heaven as your home. Amen. Your reward is in heaven. It's not here. You think people who want to insult and lie about you want you to have heaven here? They're trying to do everything to make your life miserable. Your enemy, the devil, is trying to get you to think that all the rewards of life are here. All the solutions to life are here and in him and in the ways of the world. And it never is. We had this discussion Wednesday night. Have you ever seen in the course of human history, no matter who's been in power, no matter what political party reigns in office, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, Whatever, whatever king has that ever satisfied the human soul, the answer to that is no. Yet followers of Jesus get excited for these false Christs. And seek answers when Jesus is the only answer. Government gives you something, you're going to want something else. That's just how we are. That's the nature of why we need a pure heart. Our reward is in heaven. Our reward is heaven, and our reward is in heaven. Paul reminds us of this in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, when he says, Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body by the power that in, enables Him to subject everything to Himself. Peter in 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 11, says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, you conduct yourself honorably and they still slander you. Peter's clear. That happens. Been there, can write a book on it. They will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. They don't glorify you, they glorify God. Amen. See, when you still act like a Jesus follower, even after they do all that stuff to you, the world pays attention to it for some strange reason. Amen. They don't like it. They may leave you alone because persecution to what Jesus is talking about here it tends to go in seasons. Jesus knows how much we can endure. And he actually uses it to make us more like him. And to remind us of certain realities, this being one of them, heaven is our home, not here. 
Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, in him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. If you're a Jesus follower, you're going to be persecuted. It identifies you with Jesus. That encourages us. That allows us to rejoice. Reminds us of our reward to come. It encourages us because we're reminded that we're not alone in this persecution. Look at what Jesus says here at the end in verse 12. He says, Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus tells the disciples that you're going to be persecuted just like Jeremiah, just like Isaiah, just like Hosea, just like Habakkuk, all those guys. Israel didn't like the prophets. Nobody likes anybody saying, thus saith the Lord, you need to repent or God's going to bring the house down. And each time he brought the house down. Jeremiah preaching all those years he preached, saying, y'all need to do something or else Jerusalem is going down, this country's going down. Look at what happened. He says, that's going to be happening to you and me. They're going to treat you like the prophets of the Old Testament. Acts 7.52, which of the prophets did your ancestors persecute? Actually, I should say it this way. It's because it's proper. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? You're going to live out God's way, God's plan, God's purpose, and speak God's words? It's inevitable. They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Guys, here's the deal. Jesus gives us a difficult paradox as followers of Jesus. That if we live out what he told us, we will be persecuted and we're going to be happy about it. We don't like that. We don't like that in America at all. Words of Rodney King, can't we all just get along? No. Sin won't allow it. Sin won't allow it. If you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. And you need to be happy about it. It makes us have to ask ourselves some really difficult question. Actually, I'll just leave it at one question. Am I persecuted because of who I believe in? Am I persecuted because of what I believe or how I'm supposed to live? Are you? Are you? If not, why not? Why not? Tough question. See, here in America, we've been able to do, there's a couple reasons for it. I'll just mention this one in the little time I have left here. We, we've created, we were so good at doing this, especially through the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, a little less than our world today, especially post-COVID, but we were able to create for ourselves as followers of Jesus, as Christians, our own bubble. We can go to, if you go in certain parts of the country, you can go to Christian hospitals, you can go to Christian schools, you can go to Christian colleges, you can see Christian movies, you can, can uh, let's see what else here. I mean, you can even work for a Christian. I mean, in all the, I mean, you could just create this bubble. I grew up in it. And the inclination as a mom and dad is to sit there and we want to isolate our kids from the bubble of the world, and then we become isolated. Go to the first service at 8.30. Let me ask you, how many of those guys, because they hate when I ask this question because they know it's true, how many of them know people who don't know Jesus? 
How many of them hang out with people who don't know Jesus? How many of them minister out in the community or do something out in the community where people, where they can be salt and light in the world? I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. That's the next couple of weeks. How many of them do that? They know the answer. You in this room probably know the answer to that question too. I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's what we've done. And if we're here and we're saying, man, my life is good. No, people just don't, I don't have to deal with the difficulties of being a follower of Jesus. You have to ask why. But then there's a promise in all of this. Well, the promise is there. The kingdom of heaven is ours. But even more than this, Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, beginning in verse 35, Paul says this, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. One of my favorite words. It's up there with scubula. Hyper Nike. That's the word. It's actually uper Nike, but we would know better as hyper Nike. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers nor things present, present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Folks, the, the reality is this. As, as followers of Jesus are being persecuted, and if you get to the point where some of these extremes, like Miriam's husband, whose head is decapitated because of his faith, they can rejoice and be happy because they live their lives in these places of extreme difficulty and persecution, knowing that this isn't their home and that if they die, they're not going to live with a bunch of flies hanging all over them anymore. They're not going to be starving to death. They're not going to be crying. They're not going to be tears, any more pain. And they have a mansion that Jesus has promised them so they can live for that and they can live through anything in this world for Jesus, by the power of Jesus. And we in America, we need to learn to do that now. In the kingdom culture, followers of Jesus are happy when they are persecuted because they follow Jesus and live the way he calls us to live. The reason for this is because it identifies with Jesus, reminds us of the reward to come, and encourages us because we are not alone. Amen. Jackie, I'm just going to close this out in prayer today, okay? Let's close in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Father God, we come before you now. Lord, a difficult message. Persecution is not something we all want to talk about, think about. Certainly, certainly don't want it to be described as a part of our life. Yet here we are. You've said that if we're going to live for you, we're going to live out your plan, your purpose for our lives. According to what your word says, we will be persecuted. Lord, we're coming more and more time in America where that's becoming more of a reality, even to more extreme than what we may be experiencing now. What, but praise God, God, it's not to the point where other people are experiencing in other parts of the world. Lord, we pray that we would trust in your promises, that heaven is our home, that the Spirit will be with us through it all and that people would come to know Jesus is Lord because they see in us Jesus is Lord. And if anybody in this room has never committed their life to Christ, I pray your Spirit speaks to them to say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead and today I make him Lord and Savior of my life. Lord, give them the courage to scan that welcome code and to let us know that you have spoken to them. To let them know that this world is not their home. That you will never leave them nor forsake them. And there's a mansion waiting for them because that is what you've told us. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I pray you have a blessed week. We'll see you back here next week at Living Hope Church.